how do you analyze consideration on a contract's essay question? Well, remember, to form a traditional enforceable contract, there's going to be three requirements offer, acceptance, and consideration. And thus far, we've been primarily focused on offer and acceptance, how a person goes about forming an offer and how that offer is accepted. We call that, once we establish an offer and acceptance, we call that mutual assent between the parties. If we can show after that that the offer and acceptance, the mutual assent between the parties is supported by consideration, then we're going to have a traditional enforceable contract. So how do we show whether or not the agreement is supported by consideration? Well, most courts are going to say that we have consideration when there is a bargain for exchange that establishes is a legal detriment to the promisee. If you can show a bargain for exchange and that the promisee is incurring a legal detriment, then you're going to have consideration in most courts. Okay, so what is a bargain for exchange and what is a promisee incurring a legal detriment? I think the best way to go over this is just to jump into examples immediately and just go and kind of talk about it as we go through. So let's start about some really basic examples, okay? So imagine, let's stick with our go-to. I've been using this whole series. Imagine that I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5. So let's say me is the promisor is promising to give you my dry erase marker in exchange, it's my dry erase marker in exchange for $5. Okay? Well, let's talk about legal detriment. Do you, the promisee, incur a legal detriment in this deal? Yes, right? You're giving me $5. Otherwise, you have no legal obligation to give me $5. You are giving me $5 that you would otherwise not be obligated to give me, so you are incurring a legal detriment of $5. So this element is met. Now, do we have a bargain for exchange? Is the promise inducing the detriment and is the detriment inducing the promise? This is called reciprocal inducement and it's the easiest way to think about bargain for exchange. And I know there's a million definitions if you start Googling around and researching the bargain for exchange, you're gonna see a hundred different things, but the easiest way on a contract law essay to analyze this is the idea of reciprocal inducement. Does the, promise in, does the promise induce the detriment? And does the detriment induce the promise? Well, let's see here, okay? So the promise of the dry erase marker, does my promise of the dry erase marker induce your detriment of $5? Yes, you're not just giving me the $5 out of the kindness of your heart. You're induced to give me the $5 because you're getting it in exchange for this dry erase marker. And am I, and it's the detriment inducing the promise. Am I giving you the dry erase marker out of the kindness of my heart? No, I'm induced by your detriment. I'm induced by the $5. So we have reciprocal inducement. You're giving me the $5 because you want the dry erase marker and I'm giving you the dry erase marker because I want the $5. Clear reciprocal inducement. By definition, we have bargain for exchange and you, the promisee, incurring a legal detriment. Both elements are met and every court ever in the United States, that's going to be easy consideration, right? And that's your most basic example. We have a bargain for exchange that establishes a legal detriment to the promisee. That's going to be easy consideration. Now let's change this up a little bit. Let's stick with the dry erase marker. But let's say that I'm giving you, I offer to give you this dry erase marker in exchange for nothing. I'm giving it to you for free and you accept my offer. I say, do you want my dry erase marker for free? And you say, I accept. Yes. Well, we have offer and acceptance, right? But do we have consideration? I'm offering to give you my dry erase marker for nothing. So you are giving me a big goose egg, nothing, right? You're not giving me any money. You're not forbearing from any actions. There's nothing, right? I'm giving this to you for free. So 
Start with this. Are you, the promisee, incurring a legal detriment? No. Here you are not incurring a legal detriment. You are giving up nothing that you are otherwise legally obligated to do. You're not forbearing. You're not refraining from doing anything that you have a legal right to do. You're literally doing nothing. So the promisee is incurring no legal detriment. So off the top, we know that we do not have consideration here. This is a clear gift promise. This is a promise to make a gift. And there's ways that this could be enforced, right? Maybe promissory estoppel could be an issue, quasi-contracts, right? If we built out this fact pattern, there may be other ways to enforce this gift promise, but not as a traditional enforceable contract. That's not going to work. Maybe promissory estoppel if we had detrimental reliance or other factors, right? But we're not gonna go into alternative theories of recovery and enforcement of agreements. We're talking about the traditional enforceable contract. And under a traditional enforceable contract, this is not going to be consideration because the promisee is not incurring a legal detriment, okay? And obviously, if you moved on to the bargain for exchange, right, how, I, the, my giving you the dry erase marker can't be induced by anything because you're giving me nothing. So we have no inducement. I'm giving this to you out of the kindness of my heart, right? For no reason, ostensibly. So we don't have a bargain for exchange. We do not have a promise incurring a legal detriment. So there is no consideration. That is a gift promise. And gift promises are not going to be consideration, okay? So let's keep going. Let's stick with the dry erase marker example. But let's now say that I am saying to you, I'll give you this dry erase marker for free, but you gotta drive to my house and come and get it. And let's say I live 30 minutes away from you. Okay, I'm like, but hey, I'll give you this for free, but you gotta come pick it up. Right, so I'm promising you my dry erase marker. I'm the promisor, you the promisee, have the legal detriment, right? You would argue your legal detriment is arguably coming over, spending the gas money to get to me, plus the time, right? It's a, you have to spend money to get there, you gotta take time to do it. You might try to argue as the promisee that that's a legal detriment. Now, I'll tell you in the eyes of the law, that's probably not going to work in this case. But let's run with it for a second. Let's say you're saying, I have no legal obligation to drive over to your house and I'm doing it. Okay, well maybe that's a legal detriment, probably not. But let's move on to reciprocal inducement because this is where it's definitely going to fail. Is this a bargain for exchange? Am I actually bargaining for you to come over and get this? Well, let's look at it. Is does the promise induce the detriment? Well, yes, here my promise is inducing your detriment of coming to get it, right? You wouldn't be spending the gas and time to come get this dry erase marker if I wasn't promising you the dry erase marker. So my promise is inducing your detriment, but is the detriment inducing my promise? No, right? I don't care about your gas and time. That's not inducing me to give you this dry erase marker. I'm giving you the dry erase marker out of the kindness of my heart, whatever. I'm just asking that you come pick it up. But by no means is you spending the gas and the time to come get it inducing my promise to give you this dry erase marker. So we do not have reciprocal inducement. So for that reason, this would fail. And it's probably not a legal detriment either, but either way, right? No consideration under this circumstance. We call this a conditional gift, right? It's similar to a gift promise, but there's a condition added to it. That's not going to be consideration. Again, maybe under a promissory estoppel theory or something else, but as a traditional enforceable contract, that is not going to be consideration, okay? So let's move on to a different example. Um, let's get away from the dry erase marker, right? Let's switch it up. Um, Let's see, where should we go with this? 
Let's say, this is another classic example. Let's say that I am talking and you're sitting here with me right now. You're right in front of me. We're not on camera interacting. You're sitting right here. And as I'm talking to you, I drop down on the floor and start to have a heart attack, right? I have a heart attack and I die basically on the ground, right? And let's say though, as I'm dying or as I'm dead, I don't know the science or the medicine behind this, you revive me, right? You're giving me the CPR. You bring me back and I am so grateful that you have just saved my life. I promise, as the promisor, to pay you $100, right? I'm like, wow, that was awesome. I'm alive now. I promise to pay you $100 for saving my life, okay? Well, let's break this down. Is that consideration? So immediately you're going to run into a problem here, right? I'm promising to pay you $100 in exchange for what, right? In exchange for what? From this point forward, what are you giving me? From the time I make the promise, am I getting anything in return? Do you have a legal detriment? No, right? There's no detriment here. I'm, this is another kind of example of a gift promise. I'm giving you a promise for money for something that you've already done. This is called past consideration and past consideration is not consideration right if you're promising to pay somebody for something that they have already done and completed it's going to be called past consideration it's not present consideration so when you're looking at a fact pattern and you're seeing the promise you should think from that point forward at the time the promise is made what detriment is the promise incurring from that moment forward if the detriment was incurred before the promise it's past consideration you do not have consideration um, oh, and worth noting again so that's not a traditional enforceable contract but some jurisdictions have adopted laws for this situation it's called a moral obligation plus a subsequent promise because it's not consideration as a traditional enforceable contract but in some jurisdictions there still may be a way to recover right and that's kind of the idea with all of this stuff just because there's not consideration doesn't mean it's impossible to recover it just means you're not going to recover under a traditional contract theory and that's why you always hear me say traditional contract traditional contract because i'm talking about the offer acceptance consideration traditional enforceable contract but there's more than one way to enforce an ag agreement or a promise you have promissory estoppel moral obligations plus promises right there's all kinds of quasi contracts all kinds of ways that an agreement can be enforced. This video though, we're talking about consideration under a traditional enforceable contract. And in this scenario, that is going to be past consideration, which is not consideration. Okay, now let's talk about another one. Let's, let's do an example, we can stick with the $100. Um, let's do an example where, um, let's see here, what should we do? Um, where there's forbearance, right? We need to talk about that. So let's say that I promise to pay you $100 if you quit smoking tobacco. And let's assume that you're over the age of 18, so you have a legal right to smoke tobacco. So I'm offering to pay you $100 in exchange for you to quit smoking tobacco. So you are quitting quit smoking right and we're talking about tobacco nothing else here okay so in this situation are you the promisee incurring a legal detriment yes you have a legal right to smoke and let's say that i put a time limit on this this is typically what you see here so i say i promise to pay you a hundred dollars if you quit smoking for a year Okay, well, yeah, if you, if a year passes and you've given up smoking, you haven't smoked tobacco, you had a legal right to smoke tobacco. You have refrained from doing that, so you've incurred a legal detriment. So, yeah, this works. Promisee has incurred a legal detriment. But do we have mutual inducement? Well, does the promise induce the detriment? Yes, you would not have quit smoking if it weren't for me offering a promise, I should say, promising you a hundred dollars. The reason that you quit smoking, that you incurred your legal detriment, was induced by my promise of a hundred dollars. 
And here, was I giving you $100 out of the kindness of my heart? No, I was induced by your detriment. I wanted to give you $100 in the hope that you would quit smoking. So I'm induced, my promise is induced by your detriment. We have reciprocal inducement. We have a bargain for exchange and the promise of incurring a legal detriment. I am bargaining for you to quit smoking. So hopefully you do see the difference between this example and some of our old examples with the gift promises. I remember when I asked if I would give you my dry erase marker for free, if you would come and pick it up, I wasn't really bargaining for you to come and pick it up. There was no inducement on my side. I wasn't induced by your gas and time expenditure to make that promise. Here, right, it's a little bit different. I am induced by your quitting smoking. I am bargaining to get you to quit smoking. I'm bargaining for you to quit smoking, right? Okay, so that's a, another example. I just wanted to illustrate that a legal detriment could be refraining from doing something that you're legally permitted to do. Kind of the point of this example. Um, also, promising not to sue. Uh, could also be a uh, legal detriment. So, and, and this is governed by a good faith test. So say that I offer to, uh, it doesn't matter, right? It could be anything. I offer to give you this dry erase marker and in exchange, you promise not to sue me for something that you have a good, good faith belief that you can sue me for. So what's interesting about the promise not to sue, promising not to sue can count as a legal detriment so long as the promisee believes honestly and in good faith that they do have a claim. So if it turns out that the claim was completely frivolous and they didn't have a claim to begin with, that doesn't matter. It's only about what the promisee actually believed. If that person believed in honest belief in good faith that they did have a lawsuit and you promise not to sue that can be a legal detriment okay so promising not to sue would be there um, at this point we've almost talked about everything that can arise with consideration obviously two you have pretenses of consideration one important note to make is adequacy of consideration in the sense of Fairness is not something courts usually consider unless it's just completely unconscionable, but that would fall under a defense, right, of unconscionability. In terms of consideration, what you have is pretenses of consideration, right, nominal consideration or a pretense of consideration can be considered inadequate, but generally just a, what you might say is an unfair deal is not going to fail for lack of consideration. So the example here would be, I offer to sell you my truck. Say I have a truck that's worth $10,000, and I offer to sell it to you for $1,000, right? That might be a bad deal for me, but I am, you are incurring a legal detriment. $1,000 is a legal detriment. You weren't obligated to otherwise pay me $1,000. That's gonna suffice, right? And that's a bargain for exchange. We have in reciprocal inducement there. So it doesn't matter that that was a bad deal for me. Now, if it was actually nominal or it was a pretense of consideration, say you're my cousin and I really just out of the kindness of my heart just want to give you my truck, but I know that there's this idea of consideration. So just to cover our bases, I'm like, hey, look, you know, under the table, give me a dollar and I'll give you my $10,000 truck so that we can say it's like a recital of consideration. In that sense, it's not failing because of it's an unfair deal. It's failing because that's a pretense of consideration. So it's not necessarily that the value matters, that it's a bad deal for one party, but if it truly is, it rises to the level where it's just a pretense, it's really a gift, but you're just adding a tiny amount, a cent or a dollar, just to say that there is consideration, that could fail. Um, also under consideration, you have the idea of an illusory promise. This would be where somebody's not really committing to the deal. This can fall under a consideration analysis. I offered to sell you my dry erase marker for $5 and you say something like, yeah, I accept if I feel like it, right? You're not really committing to the deal. It's like, ah, let me think about it. I'll uh, I accept if I feel like it, you know, something like that, I don't know, where you're not actually committing to the deal. So the promise in that sense is gonna be called 
called illusory. That can sometimes trip people up. That's not going to be real consideration if you aren't actually committing to the deal. But I'm pretty sure that covers everything, guys, for consideration. We talked about past consideration, illusory promises, pretenses of consideration, gift promises, conditional gifts. You know, those are promising not to sue. I would say those six things are the top six ways I see consideration tested when we're talking about actual, you know, the elements of consideration and how it can sometimes be tested. That's generally the ways that you're going to see it tested. In our next video, we'll have to talk about some issues that come up with modification and the pre-existing duty rule. So not everything you know need to know about consideration, but just determining whether you have consideration on the original agreement, not including issues that could arise with modifications of a contract. That's pretty much everything you need to know. It's pretty simple on your actual analysis if you just stick to these two elements. Was there a bargain for exchange? Did we have reciprocal inducement? And did the promisee incur a legal detriment? If you have both of those things in the majority of courts out there, that's going to be enough for consideration. But with that, guys, I will leave you to it. In our next video, like I said, we can talk about some other consideration issues that arise when you have a modification of a contract. But until then, I wish you all the absolute best. I hope this video was helpful. Until then, I'll see you at our next video.